and a warm welcome. You're joining us at Hyde Park on Other Dharana 24. Sri Lanka, after being a pioneer Asian country in introducing free market reforms in 1977, has been at the receiving end of some of the worst economic luck in the past decades. More so in the last two years with the double blow of the Easter attacks and of course the global pandemic ongoing. Now, with the government uh, having taken some firm steps to protect uh, its foreign currency reserves and maintain its um, balance of payments, criticism is levelled, accusing the government of pursuing protectionist policy. With that, the question of economic freedom begs to be asked. Uh, a country that previously ranked 83rd out of 162 countries, uh, whether Sri Lanka is on the right course to a possible recovery, considering its current trajectory. Well, to discuss all this, I've based uh, today's program on a policy paper developed by Professor Sirimal Aberatna, um, the head of the Department of Economics of the University of Colombo. A warm welcome to you. Thank you. And the policy paper, Sri Lanka's Economic Freedom, uh, will also be discussed with perspectives from Dr. Sarath Rajapatrana, head of uh, academic program for Advocato Institute. A warm welcome. Thank you for being here. And uh, we also have Dr. Nishan Demel, Executive Director for Verite Research, who will also share with us uh, their findings, their research so far. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here. Uh, let me start off talking to Professor Sirima Labe Ratna. Sri Lanka's economic freedom, your policy paper analyzes uh, Sri Lanka's economic freedom up until 2018 since 1977. Uh, if you can explain to us at the onset what the basis for this is. Yeah, we uh, rhetorically mm -hmm. say that Sri Lanka is a market economy and we have established market economy in 1977 with policy reforms uh, towards trade liberalization and so on. But I believe that uh, large part of the uh, large part of the reforms that would have otherwise done to complement this market economy reform have not yet been addressed. In fact, economy freedom index reflects all these things. And on the request of Frederick Newman Foundation of Sri Lanka, and the Frederick Newman Foundation has been here uh, in Sri Lanka operating in the areas of various development projects. Mm -hmm. uh, it has been here for more than 50 years. And on the request of Frederick Newman Foundation, I uh, completed this paper, polit policy paper, a uh, few uh, weeks ago. And uh, this discussion is on the basis of the findings of that paper. And the, uh, the, uh, the economic freedom measures actually the quality of policies and institutions of a country. Mm -hmm. Quality of policies such as macroeconomic policy like fiscal policy, monetary policy, trade policy and so on. And the institutions, the regulations, the judiciary system, the uh, rule of law, and the government, and all these institutions. So the quality of policies and institutions. So the economic freedom of the world, this report, this is annually published report by the Fraser Institute. And just like any other international data report, mm -hmm. this report is also coming out every year. So the latest report, 2020, explains how economic freedom has been in the, in the world. And uh, at the outset, I must say that economic freedom is the road to uh, progress mm -hmm. and prosperity of a nation. And that economic freedom can be uh, infringed by someone else and blocking this freedom and freedom means that individuals or a nation how much we take our decisions on the basis so how free we are to take our economic decision and then someone else can infringe into it like uh, who will infringe number one the government because the government is the basic institution which can improve the quality of institutions and policies okay. and then uh, we cannot exclude the citizens of a country because citizens ask the government, citizens select the government to infringe economic freedom. Mm -hmm. So that's how it uh, works. And then this report 
explain how different countries in the world have established economic freedom, how they have moved along these lines. And then, the, uh, as the paper reveals, actually, Sri Lanka is not uh, uh, remarkably well doing well in this area of economic freedom. Economic freedom categorize, uh, classify about 40 plus uh, indices and under different, under five headings, mm -hmm. which we call five areas. And what are these five areas? Government, number one. Number two, legal system and property rights. Number three, uh, money. Number four, uh, freedom for international trade and number five uh, regulations in different areas business regulations labor regulations mm -hmm. and financial market regulation so under these five areas there are about 40 42 uh, indices uh, they have examined to categorize how economic freedom in the world of, of course we know that always uh, there are a couple of countries like Hong Kong, Singapore, New Zealand, Switzerland. These countries are on the top. Okay. And every year they are changing first place, second place, third place, eighth place. Sri Lankan place is actually, according to the report, out of 162 countries, 83rd uh, place. That and was it's in not 2018. Or 2018. 18. 18. Okay. And where we have done well and where we haven't done well, actually it is... Uh, critically important mm -hmm. at this moment to uh, say that a couple of words about these five areas mm -hmm. where Sri Lanka have done. I, I would like to touch on that further going forward where yes. we have done well, where we have actually, uh, where we need uh, improvement in, in these five areas that you uh, speak of. Uh, but before that I'd like to turn to uh, Dr. Rajapatra. Um, in your view, where does Sri Lanka stand? How concerning is uh, the question of economic freedom of Sri Lanka when we speak in not just the current context, but policies that we have adopted for decades in Sri Lanka? Yeah, so let me start uh, where uh, Dr. Sirimal has ended. Mm -hmm. In 77, we had uh, one of the, as you point out, one of the uh, for one second developing country in the world to undertake uh, reform of our uh, of the economic reforms, mm -hmm. widespread economic reform, reforms, and that uh, the after Chile we were the in 1977. But you know we could not uh, complete it. We, we, we it didn't go far enough in my judgment. That is that we did very well on trade. We did very well on. Um, running the macroeconomics at the beginning, but it faltered as we proceeded. And one of the reasons why we, we did not hold on to the reform program, because there were other things interfering. For example, we started Mahavali. Mahavali took a lot of attention of the government and also had a very uh, huge demand on the government of, of expenditures. So while we are trying to uh, improve the tradable sector, that is exports and imports, import substitution, uh, Mahavali intervened in this sense that the government had to spend a lot of money, and particularly these, group, uh, these expenditures on the economy uh, were more on non-tradable goods, so it appreciated the exchange rate. So on the one hand, we were promoting the export sector, the tradable sector. On the other hand, we were doing something that uh, you know, to an extent negated what we were trying to do. Later it came to be called the Dutch disease. Mm -hmm. That is when one uh, project or, or one export does very well, it sets the exchange rate for others and it was not very beneficial to us. Second thing is that uh, many, many of us, I, I, I included myself, that we didn't look beyond the trade very much as uh, uh, Professor Hedriman mentioned, that is we, we didn't change the in institutions very much uh, we left the public enterprises as they were, and public enterprises have been all have been a headache all the time to us. And so we actually didn't continue with, with that thing. There were changes in the government. It's ideologically uh, one party uh, was not for freedom, for economic freedom. Other parties were for it. And so there was no consensus how to proceed. 
And think, being a democracy, I'm not blaming anybody. Being a democracy, our parties change, our governments must change, and it did change. So the enthusiasm that one government, one part of the government, or one government had, did not carry to, to the next stage. So that is one of the, that one of the problems that we had. Um, policy consistency. We speak about changes of government, decades of government change, yet we speak about the same problems uh, within society. I'd like to turn to um, Dr. Nishan Demel. You uh, veritate research, uh, you, you all do a lot of research also, but if you can explain to uh, the general public, the, in layman's term, why economic freedom is so important, why we speak uh, of this. And for a country as Sri Lanka, uh, obviously we have to adopt our own policies, but what we failed is to uh, have consistency in our policy. So how this has affected uh, Sri Lanka's way forward? Thank you, Indiwari. Uh, thank you for Derena Hyde Park uh, for hosting us, um, for uh, Frederick Nauman Foundation, I think, for supporting uh, this event. Uh, I want, I'm grateful to my colleagues and friends, uh, so I'm going to not say doctor, but just <laughs> speak as we do, Sirimal and Sarath. Um, you know, I think this is a foundationally important discussion we are having today. Um, Amartya Sen, in a famous book called Development as Freedom, uh, suggested that you know the whole pursuit of economics is you know in search of being a more developed society developed human beings uh, and he suggested that freedom is both the goal and the instrument of development that that development is not just about having more money driving bigger cars living in larger houses uh, but development is essentially about human flourishing. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about freedom, we talk about the flourishing uh, of us in our humanness. Uh, and getting there requires the exercise of freedom also. So I think Sirimal's uh, you know, research is very important because uh, the research is trying to measure advances in freedom, uh, both as an end and as a means uh, to being uh, being the kind of society and people that we want to be. And I think Indivari's question gets to the heart of it. Yeah. Uh, why are we having so many problems? Uh, so I would say it's not just about why is freedom important. We take that as basic. Uh, but the reason we don't understand it is we may not quite understand what freedom is. What do we mean by freedom? So just to maybe uh, uh, extend the discussion a little bit, I'll, I'll unpack. Uh, two or three tensions, I have about six, but let's start somewhere, uh, of how we understand freedom and how we don't. And I think fundamentally, one of the difficulties um, that, uh, that we have to overcome is in the conceptualization of freedom uh, simply as uh, maybe individual agency, my freedom to act. Mm -hmm. Because we all know that uh, the tension in that is that my freedom to act is somehow also impacted by the social arrangements that we have, uh, the kind of context or environment that I find myself. And so, we, so in navigating that tension uh, or that difference, let me kind of articulate some very uh, sort of ideas on freedom, foundational ideas. So one is the idea between what you call negative freedom and positive freedom. Mm -hmm. Uh, by negative freedom, economists are very good at measuring negative freedom. That means I have no restriction on my movement, my activity, my choices. The more less restrictions I have, the more freedom I have. That's the idea of freedom. L less and less restrictions. Less trade restrictions, less speaking restrictions. Less, uh, and the idea is that we have more freedom when we have less restriction. But there is a concept um, that goes back a long time uh, on positive freedom that says sometimes our freedom, uh, our positive freedom is enhanced by having more restrictions. I'll give you an example, a very simple one. When you travel on the road, as we all do, there is a traffic light that says when it's red, you have to stop. When it's green, you can go. That's a restriction on my freedom to move. But because of that restriction, effectively, we prevent log jams. Yeah, otherwise, at an intersection, everybody comes at the same time, nobody moves. So if you, have, if you have more negative freedom, you will have less positive freedom, less ability to move, but m less restriction on your choices also. Sometimes adding a restriction on your choices 
uh, which is increasing negative freedom, adds positive freedom, tra you actually get to move, which is the ultimate freedom that you want. Uh, this comes at a very human level. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, people are not always masters of themselves. Uh, if you are addicted to drugs, let's say, or even smoking, sometimes the best answer is to get you into a rehabilitation camp where you have no choice but to follow a regimen. You get less freedom for a period, but end up with more positive freedom. You're not addicted, you're better off. So I think that, that tension is very important. Uh, the other way that we translate it in a lot of economic discussions is this be between less government, right? minimum government, and the less government you have, the better off you are. But at the same time, economists have argued from day one that markets don't exist in the state of nature. They're artificial things. They need government, government regulation. You need to have ensure information. Uh, you need to ensure competition, uh, without which markets don't operate. Adam Smith's famous idea of, you know, that we get our dinner not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker, but from their regard to their private interest. Uh, therefore, we don't need to actually control them very much, but it requires competition. And competition is not something that happens automatically. Um, gov so how do you have maximum governance uh, for freedom, which is uh, even while you have maybe less government. Uh, I'll give you an example. I mean, today there's a controversy about the Public Utilities Commission. Uh, I was a member. <laughs> uh, who, um, and, um, and, and one of the, the I, I think, concerns that government and others have is these regulatory bodies, they're a nuisance. Uh, they cause, uh, you know, problems and questions and delays. Let's get rid of them. Mm -hmm. But a commission like the Public Utilities Commission protects the freedom of Sri Lankan people not to end up paying the highest cost, one of the highest costs for electricity that you have in Asia, yes. which is what we have in, in an unregulated environment. Yeah. We created an energy system freely. Uh, I'd like to explore this discussion <coughs> further uh, after this short break to talk about how we can maxim um, maximize rather governance uh, while we also ensure economic freedom. Do stay with us at Hyde Park on Other Than a 24. Welcome back. You're joining us at Hyde Park. Uh, Professor Sirima Laberatna, back to you. Um, there's general uh, belief in society that uh, economists don't really understand uh, the sentiments at ground level. That, uh, you know, it's, it's basically indices, measurements. Uh, so your policy paper, you're talking about economic freedom. How, how, how does this really go to uh, ground level to understand what the people feel? Um, what, what's really happening in Sri Lanka? Because there's, you see tangible development, but at the same time, given circumstances, uh, times as these, we see that governments have to take extreme measures. It's not just in Sri Lanka, but around the world. So how, how do you balance this out in your uh, findings? Yes, a very important question in the area. And also Nissan, I think, gave a, a very good start to introduce the concept of economic freedom now. Uh, this is also one of the uh, misunderstood concepts in the world and we are, I, think, I think our people, we do understand political freedom uh, better than economic freedom. Mm -hmm. But look at Singapore, a country like that and which has been always somewhere on the top, among the top five countries with highest economic freedom. But somebody can say that uh, Singapore does not have uh, freedom for people to people's movement and is highly regulated country. So how can Singapore has uh, been regarded as the country with the highest economic freedom? Exactly the answer is that what Nissan said that because you have the boundaries, whether it is political freedom or economic freedom, you have the boundaries, and it is the responsibility of the government to protect those boundaries with tight policies, so loose policies and regulation, whichever the way. And so the way that the government protects these boundaries actually infringe, uh, they damage our economic freedom. That's what it is. it means actually. It's not that the, uh, there is no government and market is the one which is controlling everything. There is no system as such. So 
it is the responsibility of the government to protect the market system and which is actually go which goes beyond our uh, political our, our trade liberalization policies and it when we look at the sri lankan case we will understand that it is much more than that because there are couple of areas couple of areas that you need to understand that even in 1977 as sarath mentioned other than following Uh, trade liberalization policies we actually forgot some of the fundamental reforms that required to sustain market economy so because of that actually p- market economy has also become a discarded uh, uh, concept today for some people and they think that all these problems are because of the market because of market no it is not because of the market it is because the market economy did not have the required foundations i can explain them by using the sri lankan case mm-hmm. and by u- using uh, the the outcome of the policy paper as well uh yeah before go you go there you yeah. just touched on uh, you know uh, earlier on before we went into the short break you did speak of the five areas what we may have done well and what we may exactly. not yeah. have Correct. so uh, i'd also like you to touch on that as you, as we speak right so the as i said economic freedom is measured under these five mm-hmm. areas and then if you look at the sub components and large number of sub components are there uh, number one government where we have done quite okay better and but that is actually the size of the government and why we have done better they are not because we we are better off in terms of managing government expenditure and taxes mm-hmm. of course our tax system if we look at our uh, direct marginal taxes uh, income taxes the ratios are quite lower compared to many other countries that is one positive area that we have but other than that the government revenue is quite low about 12 percent of gdp so that the government is restricted by that for spending on private consumption and mm-hmm. private investment so that is why when we dig deeper into that area it is not a, a, a positive achievement actually it is the it reflect the inefficiency of our taxation system number two uh, legal system this is the area out of those five areas where sri lanka has the poorest score in economic freedom legal system the rule of law throughout our history starting from 1977 policy reform i must say that market economy the foundation of the open economy is actually the rule of law when you don't have that foundation you are building a house without the foundation and it is shaky so that's what has happened to sri lanka and this is an also an area where we haven't where we haven't improved that much up to today mm-hmm. so that is the area where sri lanka scores the lowest economic freedom score third that is the money and this is another area which is actually the central bank's uh, policy this is also quite fairly okay because it measures the inflation and money supply and all these Uh, monetary f- policy measures and they are quite okay so these are the this is the only area where sri lanka has scored uh, the highest score and then international trade freedom for trade internationally mm-hmm. and that means exporting and importing in this area although we m- established our trade liberalization policies in 1977 uh, by during the last 10 years so we have actually moved backward this is the area another critical area that sri lanka has been on reverse reverse direction okay. and that is very critical and even we can confirm those things uh, by looking at our trade performance and then other area uh, next area would be regulation regulation of business environment regulation of the labor market and regulation of the financial so in this particular area if you look at those areas actually we haven't done quite well in those areas because uh, because our uh, we haven't touched actually some of these areas mm-hmm. and our administrative system our uh, lengthy bureaucratic procedures and our labor regulatory systems and Uh, the lack of uh, 
lack of mandate request for dismissal of labor so in all these areas sri lanka scores quite low so in all sri lanka is not a good performer in terms of in terms of our economic freedom in the country and that's why it is quite consistent with our economic performance also okay. because that economic freedom index report uh, it it actually provide lot of information that uh, economic freedom if you have the higher economic freedom your uh, income is higher your growth rates are higher your export performance are higher right. your human development is higher your corruption is lower poverty is lower so all these things are nicely connected to the level of economic freedom and we can see those things by looking at the other countries so that in that sense sri lanka has a long way to improve our the status uh dr rajapatrana i think um th uh, what i would like to uh, speak to you about is what really happened when professor sirmala beratna says you know we haven't done well in certain areas of these five measuring um these these uh, indexes in this is rather uh but what really happened we speak about i spoke to nishan also about consistency policy consistency and uh, uh, and uh, we try to explore how governments can regulate can bring in regulation policy but yet at the same time uh, ensure that economic freedom is uh, is assured to the nation what really happened in sri lanka and how do you propose we navigate through the challenges that uh, that these uh, changing policies have put sri lanka into uh th this is a very interesting question i i have been thinking about for a long time mm -hmm. um although we started brilliantly we couldn't carry it, it out one reason and i don't know whether my economic uh, friends will agree with me not necessarily in this company <laughs> is that uh, we have ideological divide in our country we have very strong ideological divide one group believes that they don't believe in economic freedom the government should be doing most of the things other group believes the government a limited go bounded power of the government government can always be a, a agent for the good or the bad okay so so there is no consensus on uh, what is best policy it's very difficult to get through piece of legislation in which we come and say we are going to now liberalize the economy i can quote one example that is in the 90 uh, 2014 budget the minister of finance at that time equated trade liberalization with the ltt he said we consider it like the war with the ltt economic liberalization in his judgment uh, seem to have completely uh, uh, in his judgment was like the war a terrible thing to had happened so you see that there are two extreme points here one extreme point and so we had to get rid of the uh, ideological divide between the two to get together it, to see what how we are going to reform to reform we have a big agenda for reform we because we have neglected things over time we have agenda and let me address that in a minute you know so what do you do with government everybody knows we don't have very effective government if you ask a common man you go to a government office you have to hang around there for a long time people ignore particularly people who come for certain offices we government is not functioning well uh, we need that for market to work government smart work even adam smith talked about that when he talked about uh, a famous uh, uh, book on wealth of nations it was an important part of it so without having a good framework legal framework as uh, sri mal has uh, explained we cannot really market cannot bring the benefits it it promises uh then the legal system and property rights i mean i know one country we are excellent country in south uh, america uruguay is called the switzerland of the of of latin america there are 40% of the rooms houses are vacant apartments Mm -hmm. they can't rent it because they won't get it back we had a, we have a similar situation for us also so because the legal system is not functioning well so what happens is that the, there are 40% in um, montevideo or their capital 40% of the apartments are never occupied mm -hmm. so people who own the, those things cannot get a rent on it most of the young people have now gone to canada so you see so that uh, if we didn't workout system had these 
had, if you had filled those uh, uh, shortcomings in our system, we, we would be better off not only in terms of the uh, economic uh, reform, but in terms of the legal environment and and uh, and other accoutrements that go with it. So let me take five minutes or three minutes to say, going forward, what is it that we would expect? So we can. I also follow the same rule way that uh, Sirimal is in size of the government. Mm -hmm. Size of the government. Some people will say. Uh, is large in terms of public expenditure is very large because the argument that some mo most of the expenditure b which is not supportive of a, per of a particular project or a particular thing is, is is competing with the private sector. Uh, sometimes Macroevans call it a sort of a crowding out the private sector on the one hand. Legal system, as we heard, has a lot to uh, a lot to reform mm -hmm. so that people can do transactions uh, safely and be confident that you get paid for what you have done uh, people can collect rents sound money yes uh, uh, we have done well but the point is that if we continue in the future with large fiscal deficit we are going to lose that so we are in danger if we cannot be uh, control the uh, expenditure on our side because revenue is already very low we are going to have a situation there the sound money we have, we had better uh, scores than many other countries may disappoint us international trade there is no there is not very free international trade we have now reintroduced uh, banning certain items and unpredictably so if you are a businessman you want to get into a certain area then they are, you cannot be sure with you the same uh, uh, estimate that you made about what you can sell and buy will be, be will continue into the future. Mm -hmm. uh, and regulation, we have we don't have a good competition policy. We had it; it was closed down in 2003. So those are very essential for the freedom to work. Right. So my plea would be say let's address those things mm -hmm. if you want to. Uh, do well in the future. Right. Uh, I'd like to uh, go back to Nishan. I think Dr. Nishan de Mel, we were, we were speaking about uh, policy consistency, but moving on from uh, from these indices that uh, the policy paper were based on, that the economic freedom is measured anywhere in the world, government and taxes. I think in more recent times, we've been talking about budget 2021 and the decisions that government has taken with regard to taxation and the taxation policy. Uh, but do you not think the, that the government has ensured um, uh, economic freedom with the current tax regime or are there any challenges that you foresee? Thank you Indiviri and thanks for all the comments y'all are making. <coughs> I, I think Sirimal made this very interesting point about how ta reduced taxation mm -hmm. uh, increases economic freedom but at the same time he pointed out how Singapore has a lot of economic freedom but higher taxation right? If yep. you know. Why is that? So that brings me to my third tension perhaps so I said the first tension was between negative freedom and positive yeah. freedom. The other between minimum government and maximum governance, which Sarath also touched on, competition being critical so that the market is playing fair. And I think Sirimal also said it. A market that doesn't play like an economist thinks a market should play is not really a market, not a free market. We, we understand the word free incorrectly sometimes about a market freedom to not to do anything you want but freedom to act in a way that creates a social arrangement that's beneficial to yeah. everyone. That's really what a market really is. And I think Sirimal's point is very important that the failure of Sri Lanka is not too, too much market, maybe too little market, though we call it the market. Okay. Uh, so, and, and my third tension perhaps is the tension between the freedom to choose and the opportunity to choose. Mm -hmm. I'm free to walk into a supermarket and buy anything I want. But if I don't have money, I have no opportunity to do that. A poor person, by virtue of being born poor to, to a poor family, not having money, not having a job that pays adequately, doesn't have freedom, it has uh, theoretically the freedom to choose, but effectively no freedom to choose anything uh, because they don't have money. So really poverty, destitution, deprivation, um, 
is a, is a significant part of unfreedom. And the way countries like Singapore fix that problem is by very strong social protection mechanisms. Now, Sri Lanka has a foundation of social protection, mm -hmm. a free education, mm -hmm. free health care. Uh, we need perhaps to expand that to other kinds of universal benefits. Uh, but the problem with the tax reduction coming to Indivari's question, uh, Indivari's question uh, and the way we are handling it is we are thinking that reducing taxes can somehow make the economy better and that it is, uh, it is by itself a sign of more freedom. But if that takes away money that the government can use to protect the vulnerable, to protect the poor, uh, to uplift social services, then actually we are generating unfreedom. While, uh, so there's a tension. Obviously, we don't want government to tax everything you earn. But neither do we want government to actually create unfreedom for the vulnerable. Right. And, and so you have to figure out how you solve that problem uh, in a reasonable, equitable way. So if you, so I think, again, it's not simply measuring one thing. And that's what I think the strength right. of Serimal's uh, paper I'll is. Yes. I'll have to interrupt you no here, worries. but we'll speak further after this short commercial break. But something I'd like to speak once we return is, uh, is whether we should not consider current challenges that we see world over, a pandemic ongoing, uh, global cha economic challenges. With all that, how do we move forward? How do we consider Sri Lanka's economic freedom? We'll speak of all this once we return after this short break. Just stay with us. Welcome back. You're joining us at Hyde Park. Um, we were talking about economic freedom, liberty, and how people can ensure that they are free to take um, economic actions. But I'd like to move to talk to uh, Dr. Rajapatrana. Uh, I did mention that we have to consider the current uh, pandemic, the challenges posed by the ongoing uh, threats, the, uh, the constraints, obstructions of the ongoing pandemic, because this is not just uh, uh, a challenge that Sri Lanka faces, but world all over we see economies struggling to manage to come out of uh, the uh, threats posed by the ongoing pandemic, whether it's trade, whether yeah. it's travel, whether it's uh, continuing the economy. Uh, so given that situation, we see the government taking certain measures to restrict imports, to, to uh, bring down taxes, uh, that to relieve the people, of course, but uh, at the same time, there are certain other measures also which are criticized by the government, by, by uh, certain parties. So why, why I like to talk about the criticism is because we, uh, you spoke about trade liberalization and um, why certain measures that we've taken throughout have not turned out well uh, for the sustainability of the economy to ensure that uh, economic freedom that we speak about today is ensured. Um, so are you saying that the measures taken by the government now does not uh, go hand in hand with what we're talking today? No, or, or is there some other explanation yeah, I'm to not this? not actually addressing that issue at all. Hmm. I, I, I think that what they have done about COVID as brilliant at the beginning, mm -hmm. they have a little slippage later, but that's the nature of a epidemic. There's nothing you can do about it. The, you, there are only particular way of dealing with epidemic and the government is doing it and done it. I am, no, I am, my question about trade doesn't, de I'm asking the question, what happens after the epidemic? Mm. That is the question I want to answer, mm. saying what we, can do after the epidemic and it's not going to be you know li life is restricted even for a virus so after a while we, ha we have to really face up to the <coughs> situation the covid is behind us we have used vaccinations or whatever and then how we how are we going to order our economy in a way to realize the economic freedoms on the one hand and to raise basically gdp growth rate deal with poverty and the other issues that are there, that were there when the COVID came and uh, uh, disturbed what, what was going on. So there I would say two or three things mm -hmm. quickly. When I say liberalize the economy, it is not the freedom of the wild as import anything you want. No, it is sort of allowing prices to determine what we are going to export and import, right? Sometimes you have to introduce um, uh, temporary measures. I, I appreciate that. I understand that. But I have seen countries in worse bind than we were. We have been uh, not with epidemic, but with bad economic policies, switching on to 
a better reform. I have seen that in uh, Vietnam. I have seen it uh, now happening in uh, Bangladesh. So these are, there are answers to these issues. They, they, we, have, we can learn from what other countries do. We can learn from our own experience, what we have done and how uh, we have removed the bias against exports. Mm -hmm. We had to improve the efficiency of our uh, handling of these goods for uh, imports and uh, exports. Uh, and import substitution is equally as important as uh, getting the exports going. Mm -hmm. They are actually two sides of the same, same coin. And so I, I was addressing that. Then so what we do after the epidemic. And I leave it to my two uh, learned colleagues to deal with the epidemic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Professor Sirima Laberatna, you talk about, you, you have certain uh, concluding remarks that you've made. I think we may have touched on those as we spoke during uh, the earlier parts of the program. But you specifically mention uh, in your concluding remarks that uh, confidence in the efficacy of market economy has been shaken by growing protectionist tendencies. Um, if you can explain to us uh, what this is all about and how it threatens the economy. It is, uh, yes, thank you Indiyuri for the question and it is because uh, we know that uh, after the uh, global financial crisis in 2009 mm -hmm. and now more than 10 years, I think uh, the world economy has not been in good shape mm -hmm. and particularly in rich countries as well. So there have been some tendencies and in that direction, even in the United States, where we had the, the higher uh, level of economic freedom. There have been protectionist tendencies and that is natural. And uh, in Sri Lanka too, we will see that against this pandemic crisis. But uh, as far as the Sri Lankan economy is concerned, what uh, I would say that uh, even without the COVID pandemic issue, uh, we would have been hit by the same crisis sooner or later because we have been moving in that particular direction over the last uh, many decades. Mm -hmm. And so that is not a surprising thing that we are uh, where we are today with uh, downgraded uh, rating and uh, import controls and uh, government expenditure problem and also money printing, all these things. And they were actually the, the crisis responses to the crisis situation but what i am uh, what i am worried now is uh, we understand by looking at the policy paper because uh, we saw that why are the where are the weak areas of this economy where we have to make the improvements and but the covid uh, crisis also gives us a, a, a right opportunity and you know we are famous for missing the opportunities throughout our history so this is another opportunity that uh, we should not miss i would say are you saying we haven't uh, explored uh, the best that we yeah, could exactly. within this throughout our post independent history we are famous internationally famous for missing not missing the opportunities to miss any opportunity so <laughs> Uh, this is where we are right now is also another big opportunity so actually to make the corrections. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the, the right now the, the, the paper that we have concluded and it also gives number of areas where we have done well over the past uh, couple of decades and mm -hmm. years and where we have to improve quite a lot. Mm -hmm. And those things have been responsible for the dismal performance of this economy in the recent past. So this is the right opportunity to uh, make those corrections because some of those things are uh, structural issues that the government has to take deliberate, purposive uh, reform process to. And then actually as Sarat said that after the pandemic is over, mm -hmm. we are on right track to move forward. Uh, we've spoken about uh, how Sri Lanka has fared 1977 to 2018. We've spoken of uh policies that should have been taken, that were taken, and that are yet to be taken. But going forward, I think we have just three minutes on the program. Um, I leave it to you to explain to us so, um, how you, uh, w what your analysis is, your perspectives of us moving forward as a nation, ensuring economic freedom as well as prosperity for the nation. Thank you, Indiwari. Uh, so I think the, the enormous value of our conversation today is the, is the way we have made freedom fundamental mm -hmm. to the question of economic prosperity. So it's not prosperity in money terms. 
but well-being and that's a better word than prosperity and well-being constitutes significantly of human flourishing and freedom take covid what is the objective uh, we have with regard to covid is it to minimize the spread or is it to maximize human freedom and wellness because we know that minimizing the spread causes enormous unfreedom uh, deprivation poverty joblessness uh, but allowing the disease to spread unchecked can also create a lot of death uh, and, and an incapacity for the system to cope. But if we make freedom the objective, then we begin to see how we balance uh, what's best for society. And that includes, I think, giving people, you know, information, uh, reducing fear. Uh, creating stable plans that people can work around. So it's the, not the disease or the spread of the disease that itself is the problem. It's the human consequence to human lives that is the problem. And most people will not die of COVID. Uh, and we need to protect more the people who are more vulnerable. So this is why putting the perspective of freedom rather than just material prosperity, uh, rather than things like economic growth, uh, I think gives us, a, in a policy-making perspective, a far richer, a far more human a way to approach uh, the problems that we are trying to solve. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your time. We had with us Professor Sirima Laberatna, Head of the Department of Economics at the University of Colombo. Thank you very much thank you. for your time here with us. And um, also Dr. Sarat Rajapatrana, Head of uh, the Academic Programs for Advocata Institute. Thank you. thank you for joining us here at Hyde Park. And we also had with us Dr. Nishan Dimel, Executive Director for Verite Research. Thank you for your time here at Hyde Park. Um, we did speak of Sri Lanka's economic freedom, uh, the current challenges and the way forward. Thank you for joining us here tonight. Have a pleasant evening. Good night. <laughs>